The uh, only real problem on Vancouver Island is uh, the mountain lions. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Vancouver Island has the densest population of mountain lions in the world. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's here. <laughs> I guess there's a mountain lion here tonight. Uh, that's how dense the population is. They are in this comedy club right now. All the cougars, yes, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Took a huge risk. <laughs> but yes, we have, we have the densest population of mountain lions in the world. Uh, I don't know how this happened. You know, I guess they keep multiplying and they can't get on the ferry, so they're just <laughs> piling up here. And it's actually such a problem. When, when I was a little kid, I... Uh, had a conservation officer come to my school and educate the children about the murder cats that were <laughs> lurking behind the playground. <laughs> and I'll never forget what the conservation officer said. He sat down and he was like, you know, kids, you'll probably never see a mountain lion, but statistically, mountain lions have already seen you. <laughs> the scariest thing I'd ever heard in my life. The fear of mountain lions has been burned into me so deeply, it is irrational. I live in Vancouver now, in the city, and, uh, you know, I, I went out, I was walking down like a, a creepy alley the other day, and I heard some shuffling behind me, and my first thought was the mountain lions, oh my god. They finally found me. And I turned around slowly, and it was just some guy with a knife, like... It's so relieved. Thank, thank God he's got a knife in case there's a mountain lion around here. You know? <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah, but generally, island problems are uh, very different than uh, mainland problems. I met a friend for coffee in Vancouver a few months ago, and he arrived late to the coffee, and uh, he was all shooken up and, uh, you know, kind of trembly. And I was like, hey, man, what happened? And he was like, some guy tried to mug me, but I managed to fight him off. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrifying. And then when I visited my grandmother on rural Vancouver Island a few weeks ago, I... Uh, I, I, I knocked on her door, and she came to the door, and she had the same, like, traumatized, like, trembly look in her face. I was like, oh, my God, Grandma, what happened? She was like, there's just too many hummingbirds. I can't feed them all. I... It's a nightmare. I, I, was, uh, I was raised by hillbillies on the island. I know uh, it's hard to imagine I have very good posture, but I, <laughs> I was raised by rednecks. And uh, a few years ago, uh, a relative of mine, uh, he died and I inherited all of his guns. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I guess it'll be fun. You know, I could just add some blast into my life. And... Um, I went to the rifle range, and uh, I, I can't really enjoy guns uh, because the ammunition is so expensive, I can't have a good time. Like, I sit at the rifle range, and the only thing going through my head is I'm like, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. Oh, there's a, there's a big one, eh? Well, that's pretty cool. That's a three dollars. Oh. Oh. What a nice coffee. <laughs> and I can't really, you know, you can't have guns for self-defense in Canada. It doesn't work that way here. Uh, you know, if you have guns at your place, you have to have them locked behind layers of security. You can't, it would be impossible if someone broke into my apartment. It would take me a long time to get to the guns. <laughs> so if someone breaks into my apartment, I basically have to monologue like a Bond villain. <laughs> Like, if someone smashes into my apartment, I'm going to have to be like, <gasps> get a glass of wine, walk into the living room. <laughs> ah, noble thief. Well done. 
You have breached my security. What a fool I was thinking a sliding glass door would be enough. Now, before you beat me senseless and burgle my belongings, I thought I may toast you man to man. Now, my most expensive brandy I keep in that uh, tall safe there in the corner. So if you don't mind, I will get our toast prepared here. You have done well tonight. I didn't even hear you come in, and I think you should be quite proud of yourself. I would say your burglary was almost flawless, sir. Your only mistake being that you allowed me to talk for this long. A dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar! Three dollars! I am a, I'm a very good grandson, um, as all island boys are. There's a lot of grandparents here. And uh, I follow my grandma all the time, and my grandma is very funny. She's 96 years old, and she has a very dark sense of humor, and she always giggles after she says something horrifying. Like, almost every time we end our phone call, I'll be like, okay, Grandma, I'll talk to you soon. She's like, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whenever we talk on the phone, she would always talk about, like, she'd moved into a, uh, a retirement home in the last few years, and she would always talk about um, the dinners they have there. She loves the food so much, and so I uh, went to go visit her in the retirement home, and uh, I was in a room, and I saw a laminated... A folder that said DNR on it, and I thought, oh, DNR, that's short for dinner. And, uh, like, dinner, this spells dinner. I was like, Grandma, is that your dinner menu? She's like, no, it means do not resuscitate. <laughs> I, I love talking to my grandma, though. 96 years old, she's got a lot of amazing perspective on world events. I always like to get her opinion on things going on in the news. And uh, I asked her, I said, uh, like, Grandma, how does, the, how does the pandemic compare to other things you've lived through? Like, was it, uh, was it worse than, like, wh what was it like compared to World War II? And she was like, oh, it was so much worse. And I was like, what? <laughs> how was the pandemic worse than World War II? And she was like, oh, you know, World War II made sense. The pandemic was very confusing. <laughs> And I thought, you know, that's kind of a fair point, honestly. Like, World War II is a huge tragedy, but it is a very simple story, you know? You've got, like, Hitler and the team of evil boys that's, like, the worst villains of all time on one side, and then the other side, you've got, like, Tom Hanks and the Band of Brothers <laughs> and all the greatest heroes. And when the war ends, you know, every newspaper in the world is like, the war is over! And then, you know, if you're white, you get a Cadillac and a house. It's like... Pretty awesome. Like, I don't think we would think of World War II with the same reference for the story if World War II ended like the pandemic ended, right? Like one year in 1945, all the newspapers in the world are like, there's 85% less World War II this year than... I think we're gonna call it. It's probably done about, just feel free to travel. We didn't find Hitler, he's out there somewhere. <laughs> we are monitoring the situation. <laughs> a lot of people uh, 
Revenge traveling this year. I heard that term. I hated that term. The news is saying everybody's revenge traveling for the travel they didn't get to do in the pandemic. And that sounds terrible, having a revenge holiday. Uh, I don't think you have to tra travel with revenge in your heart. Like all these people going to the Grand Canyon, like, look at the stupid cliffs! I was supposed to be here a year ago! Get in the truck! Look at Yellowstone National Park, it's a year older than it's supposed to be! 2020 was the best year for geysers. <laughs> Traveling is very popular these days. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of influencers, a lot of rich influencers always posting about traveling. They always say they're going on an adventure. But they're all these rich people. Like, traveling is not an adventure if you're wealthy. Like, it's just a seamless series of events. <laughs> You want to go on an adventure when you travel, travel poor. <laughs> like, you'll have the biggest adventure of your life. Try and live in Europe for three months on a budget of a thousand dollars. You're going to rent an Airbnb in Romania that's like, um, if you're going to stay here, no garlic, no crucifixes. <laughs> it's like a dollar a night, no problem. <laughs> I was fortunate to, to travel right out of high school. I lived in France for a little while. That was cool. Um, it was interesting living in France. You know, I don't, I don't speak uh, French at all, which makes it tough. Um, they speak French like all day there. <laughs> it's very humiliating not speaking the, the language. You know, I basically had to be Mr. Bean to get my point across. <laughs> I tried to get a haircut in France, and I walked into the barber shop like, oh, oh, oh. oh snip, snip, oh. <laughs> yeah, Rowan Atkinson. <laughs> but yeah, people travel for all sorts of different reasons. You know, some people. Uh, travel because they want to find out things about different cultures, they want to find out things about themselves, but when you actually go traveling, you learn that all you find is Australians. And, um... <laughs> you, can, you could go to a, a, a remote mountain village in Nepal and be watching the sunset and, like, softly in the distance you'll just hear, like, beautiful. And I don't, I don't blame it on the Australians. It's just part of their life cycle. They're just not like other people, you know? Like, they, they spawn in Australia. They're almost like salmon, right? They spawn in Australia. As soon as they're strong enough, they leave to, like, go collect work visas and PR cards. And then, when they're ready to reproduce, they return to Australia. Because they have to make sure their weird accent continues forever, you know? Can't lose it. Raising their little kids like, remember, it's pronounced no. 